And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple. The double-headed monster that that is Full Moon Enterprises. Please hold your Ozzy Osbourne jokes, they're way too easy. <laughs> and your Werewolves of London jokes, they're also way too easy. The cre the the creators of Shotguns and Sorcery, which has which has been which has been appearing in the form of a of a of a book series, as well as as well as adaptations into the cyber system and now crowdfunding in a fifth in a D and D fifth edition version. And congratulations on getting funded in four hours. So you got you got in the time it takes me to sit through the order eighteen eighty six, you guys managed to raise ten thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. <good> <laughs> uh, the one the one and only double head double headed monster that probably gets way too many M and M's as as Halloween candy. Marty and Matt Forbeck. How you guys doing hey, tonight? I'm doing fine. You got the joke out of the way right away, so I appreciate that. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. I fig I figure if I if I didn't um someone's going to do it in the comments. Um it's pro it I'd imagine it would be I'd imagine it would be even that you'd probably be getting the joke even worse if you guys were lawyers. Oh, very likely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, me um M M and M four back. <laughs> Oh, exactly. Now my father's an attorney, so there you go. But he's a yeah. K. He's Ken Forbeck, so oh. doesn't hit him as hard. There's got, there's always got, there's always got to be somebody to who who wants to try and be different. That's right. He's got to ruin the whole thing for everybody. <laughs> um. Well. <laughs> so I'd like I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, and norm normally I normally I do the whole I do a whole thing about how you how you got into role playing, but. Shotguns and sorcery is a very special case. So before we even get into that, I need to do a bit of a chicken and the egg kind of question. Because as, as I recall, um this was this this was written as a setting for D&D 3rd edition at one point, but then real life got in the way. So was the was this was this written as a, was 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 it written first as a as a sto as a standalone story that then beca that then became a campaign setting, or was it the other way around? Uh, it was originally a standalone campaign setting, right? It was going to be a campaign setting for uh, Dungeons and Dragons Third Edition, mm -hmm. and I actually sold it to Mongoose Publishing. They were going to license it from me and then hire me to write the books as well, which was going to be a great deal for me. But um, then my wife got pregnant with quadruplets, and I had to shelve it because I was just didn't have any extra time to spend on personal projects like that mm -hmm. uh so it didn't actually i didn't write too much up for it i think i had an outline for the book and a short proposal i had written maybe like the first six pages of it so i wouldn't even count that as anything you know that's not even a draft uh and then the next time i got to it was 10 years later when robin laws asked me to do a short story for him and i dusted off shotguns and sorcery and thought okay i'll set it in this and have some fun with it mm -hmm. um that's where it ended up actually finally taking shape in the uh, form that anybody ever saw it actually outside of my house uh, oh. was in the new hero volume two, which was an anthology that Robin had edited for the people over at Pelgrim press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm and then it became, uh, then I decided to keep writing with it. So I mm -hmm. ended up writing a stor short story for the origins writers anthology. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, I decided to start writing novels for it. So we ended up with, uh, uh, in 2012, I wrote a series. I had this crazy ambition to write 12 novels in a year because I'm a pretty quick writer. Mm -hmm. And I ended up uh, deciding to do 12 for 12, which was uh, 12 novels in the year 2012. And I, unfortunately, it was also Robin and Ken Height and a bunch of other guys who encouraged me to do this because they wanted to see me explode in the most amazing way. Um <laughs> And so I, so I separated them out into four different trilogies, ran a Kickstarter for each trilogy. They all funded, and I set to writing them. The second of those trilogies was a trilogy of shotguns and sorcery novels. Mm -hmm. um, and those books did pretty well. Everybody was excited about them. We had uh, uh, then uh, we actually licensed them out to somebody else to do enhanced ebook versions of those, where they're going to be doing uh, 
like animation and maps and voices and music and you know, character profiles and all sorts of neat stuff. But the company ended up going bankrupt before they could actually produce it. So the art director over there was a big role-playing game fan. He said, man, I want to do a role-playing game based on this. I said, well, no, you know, I, I used to run Pinnacle Entertainment Group. I can do a role-playing game. I'll do it myself if I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And after about a year of him bugging me, I said, you know, you're right. I'm never going to get around to this. So if you want to do it, let's do it. So I licensed it out to Outland Entertainment, to Jeremy Muller over there. And that was back in 2015. And he ran a Kickstarter for it back then. Um, and then Jeremy, you know, it went, it went really well, actually. Uh, we ended up funding for like $60,000. and There was a whole bunch of stretch goals. Uh, Jeremy ended up, the company had some uh, problems, so they didn't actually end up shipping the book until 2020, um, mm -hmm. at which point I, the license was expiring. And Jeremy and I had a sit down where we hashed out, you know, I, I had a heart to heart with him saying, are you really all that interested in this? Or is this just haunting you at this point? And maybe you want to do other stuff because he'd already been publishing lots and lots of other books and games. And, you know, as much as he was like, no, he was a very tenacious guy. He really wanted to finish it. I said, I'll tell you what, Marty and I will do the writing. You'll do the artwork. We'll finish it up. And then we'll start publishing stuff on our own. And he said, mm -hmm. okay, that seems fair. So uh, so we managed to finish off their original Kickstarter, uh, like, on October 15th. And then on October 16th, we pushed the button for the fifth edition version of it, mm -hmm. which Marty had already been writing at that point for several months. And we actually had the text in hand for it yep. entirely all done. Uh, which means that when, this time around there should not be any major delays, you know, knock wood on that. But um, we have 95% of the writing done and 95% of the artwork done. And we have Rob Schwalb who's doing the development work as we speak on this. And it, it should be out like uh, hopefully just around the end of the year or beginning of next year, uh, at least the PDF form. And then who the hell knows how long it's going to take to print stuff in this environment mm -hmm. we have globally today. But we're going to do the best we can to get into people's hands well before our deadline, which we set, which was August of next year. Yeah, um, the way you describe it, it, it sounds it sounds like a lot of the journey to its creation was peer pressure in writer form. Well, sure. I mean, uh, <laughs> it was an idea that I had sitting around, and then you know, it's like your buddy dares you to do something. They're like, "Hey, we need a story from you." Honestly, you get to a point uh, where, where I am right now, where people just ask you for short stories for things, right? Yeah. Um, and for me, honestly, writing short stories is kind of painful because. It's a lot of work that goes into them, into any kind of a setting you're developing, no matter how small the story is. And if you're going to do that kind of work on it, it seems like you'd be better off writing a novel. But in Shotguns and Sorcery, I had a setting I'd already been playing around with. So I thought, oh, that'd be fun to actually write stories in it. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we got further into it, I'm like, well, let's, yeah, let's do more of this, right? And uh, 12 for 12 was something where I had like kind of joked about it for a couple of years, starting in 2010 with some friends. And they're like, you're going to do it, right? You're going to do it, right? I'm like, eh. And it was this thing where I like it was such an attractive dare that I couldn't refuse it, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, and it worked out pretty well. I, mean, I actually didn't manage to write a dozen novels that year. I managed to write um, ten of those novels: a novel for the Leverage tele Television Show mm -hmm. uh, that was on TNT in those days. Oh yeah, and uh, nine issues of Magic: The Gathering comic book for uh, IDW, and a novel, a novella for StarCraft II, which Blizzard published on their website. Um, so I didn't, I didn't quite succeed, but if I failed, I failed well, at least. Right. And I think setting high goals for yourself is a good way to actually come in and doing spectacular things, even if they're not, uh, uh, quite where you wanted to be. I was about to say, are you trying to out novel Sanderson or something? I don't know if that's possible. Actually. No, <laughs> Brandon's a pretty amazing writer. He does a lot of great stuff and he's, uh, also very prolific. Right. Um, and yeah, I've been on, on panels and met Brandon at a, a number of different shows. Great guy, does some amazing stuff, and did a great job taking over the wheel of time, actually. Yeah, and um, I've jo I've jokingly said I want whatever drugs he's on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you can write that quickly and be that uh, cre uh, sustainably creative for that many years in a row, I think we'd all sign up for that. I mean, I've, I mean, um, certainly, can, I've cert. Uh, it certainly can't be worse than, a than anything else I've taken than anything any other medication I've taken. Um, Probably not. <laughs> but to get to get back on to get back on on a bit more of a traditional route for me. Um, sure. I'd like both of you to get to give me your origin story when it comes to role playing. Um, okay, I'll go first because mine's earlier. Um, I started out as a. Uh, I had a kid across the street from me who uh, his mother bought him the. Uh, the Holmes box set of Dungeons and Dragons, which has got the dragon on the front of it. Um, but, you know, kind of uh, more primitive. It was the thing that came out after the white box Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and she bought it for him at Kmart on a blue light special and gave it to him for Christmas. And he sat on it for several months, not knowing what the hell to do with it. And our parents were getting together, our mothers, and said, you know, you should really go play with Mike and Pat over there. Um, and eventually I did. I went over to their house, or I think we had them over at my house, actually. And we played Dungeons and Dragons. And we just freaking loved it. We loved it so much. We played, I think we started that summer after school it ended, and we were kind of bored. Mm -hmm. uh, and we played it every day, all summer long. We'd play baseball the, during the day when the sun was shining, and then go home and play D&D &D every night. Mm -hmm. And it was such a deadly game because we were mixing it up with AD and D stuff that we had found and didn't really understand the difference between them. That we, I think, we ended up killing off the party every other night, right? So, uh, and you would just roll up a new crew of people like, okay, here's Holy Man sixteen coming at you right now, my favorite cleric, and uh, just having a ball at it. So, uh, from there, I ended up going to a lot of different gaming conventions because I grew up in Southern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up going to my first Winter Fantasy, I think, when I was thirteen years old in Lake Geneva at the American Legion Hall where I played Boot Hill with Steve Winter, and my mother embarrassed me by talking to Gary Gygax too much. Um, and, you know, uh, just eventually... Isn't, that, isn't that what parents do, though? They embarrass uh, their kids? It was perfect, right? It, uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of which, Marty, why you, that's a good segue for you to take over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, it isn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you don't yeah, live in my house um, anymore. I can't public punish you for anything. So go yeah, ahead. Uh, uh, what's my origin? Uh, I had a dad who uh, who knew about it. Uh, <laughs> Might have heard about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had a dad who was into the stuff, and he got me hooked. Um, but tell uh, me what this game was. That's a fun story. Uh, my, my, my first game, the first time uh, I ever played a uh, a proper game of Dungeons & Dragons was at Gary Con 1. Uh, I played with, with Frank Menser as the DM. Uh, we played uh, Palace of the Vampire Queen, the, the very first uh, published module ever for D&D. For &D. That, 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 that was amazing. I was, I was like 10 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that, that was great. Yeah, for guys who don't know, Frank was uh, Gary Gygax's right-hand man at uh, TSR for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and Gary Con is the convention that Gary's kids put on for him. The Gary Con Zero was actually the reception at Gary's uh, funeral, right? That we did at the American Legion Hall, where I went to my first convention. And so, you know, many, many years later, I got to bring Marty for his very first convention in the same building in Lake Geneva uh, and have Frank run him through a game, which was fantastic. And Frank's a great game master, and uh, he actually handed everybody a certificate at the end of it, which Marty now has in a frame that he has in his apartment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I should... I should note that I should note as a bit of an aside um, of the many people who who have um, who have graced my tent who have graced my temple. Um, James Ward is one of them. Oh yeah, Jim's a great guy. Um, but given given that given that particular his given that particular history, um, did you did you mostly did you mostly stay within the within the confines? Uh, when it came to your when it came to your gaming, did both of you mostly stay within the um, D and D confines, um, or 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 did you jump around between between different games? I know, I know you have I know you have um, Matt because of some because of some of the stuff that you've published under. Right. Yeah. But even when I was just starting out, I was a gaming omnivore. Right. I like I would grab any game I could find and play it. Mm -hmm. uh, we were playing Boot Hill and Gamma World and Villains and Vigilantes and squad leader and all sorts of things dawn patrol anything we can get our hands on i hope in to fact, god you didn't play phoenix command no we didn't play phoenix command fortunately but uh we did play like there was a game called gangbusters that was in an issue of dragon magazine and mm -hmm. we actually ran that for a couple months too just having yeah, fun with that's anything. come back exactly yeah it, it's um uh, oh god it's mark what's his last name uh mark mark hunt I yep. think is actually the publisher of it. Yeah, and, uh, and you have no idea how tempted I was to make the Porky's joke when I when I talked yeah, with him. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, no, don't go there. <laughs> uh, Mark's a great guy. I actually met him at GaryCon a number of years ago, and he's doing some great work with that. He did a what he calls a B slash X edition of Gangbusters, which mm -hmm. is kind of like the basic expert version. Um, oh yeah, and it's a lot of fun. It's really very true to the original game. But he's to, no, I'm sorry. He was, that's Gangbusters. We played a game called Crime Fighters that was actually in Dragon Magazine that was that predated Gangbusters. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I actually played in the Gangbusters tournaments at Gen Con 
uh, with Mark Akers, who was the designer of the game, mm-hmm. and uh, ended up in the final round several times. Mark would always lose his voice, and we'd all kind of look at each other and say, we're all going to just share the victory at this point because he's dying? Sure, okay. <laughs> um, what, he didn't bring any water with him? Oh, he did, but I'll tell you, on Sunday, it doesn't matter how much water you bring to Gen Con. On Sunday, if you've been running games for, you know, one year I ran 40 hours of games at Gen Con, and by the end of the show, your voice is shot no matter how well you try to take care of it. Yeah. I guess all I can say on the matter is bring more water. <laughs> uh, I, I, you can see these guys. You could have an IV hooked up, right? Uh, my secret was always taking, was uh, chewing on cough drops, like, constantly, right, just to uh, soothe your throat mm-hmm. and make sure that you weren't dying at any point. And you were you're going through a whole... What did you have like? Did you have like three or four packages of halls or something? I would bring uh, like a box of what was called Fisherman's Friend, which are like the worst tasting. Oh God, I, I hate <laughs> those. I have only they ever have taken menthol in them, and they really do a good job of, of letting you keep your voice. I mean, oh. you smell like a, a pack of cigarettes for the rest of your life, but it's uh, but it was, but they work. They're really good. Oh, they they work. It's just, it's just that I w- it's just that I wouldn't exactly. <laughs> I would only, I only, I only put, I only put myself through through those if I absolutely have to because, because the taste of them, ha- the taste of them in my mouth is something that I'd rather wash out as quickly as possible. Yeah, they're vile, right? <laughs> but they're actually, but they work really well. Recently, Halls has come out with ones that actually have more menthol in them, uh, and they come in like lemon and cherry. So I usually switch over to that instead. But back in the day, it was a lot of Fisherman's Friend. Mm-hmm. Oh. This is this is a question that I ask a lot of people, and it's it's one where the answers tend the answers tend to vary depending on who I ask. But from your perspective, what's the appeal? What do you what do you think it is that bring that brings people to um, role playing? Well, to me, it's it's getting together with your friends first and foremost, mm-hmm. right? Um, because you know, it's any time you have a good excuse to get together with pals and do something creative together, that's a great thing, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of us have a lot of friends that we don't get to see, and sometimes we have to come up with excuses for reasons to see them. Uh, and that's really the main course of it all. But uh, why is role-playing exciting as opposed to just like watching a football game or whatever, it's be- or even a movie? It's because it's something you can do together and mm-hmm. create something that's entirely your own that you then suddenly have your own set of in-jokes and stories and everything else you're coming up with. Uh, and I think that that radically appeals to people who are missing out on connection with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh- at the at the very least, at the very least, you can laugh at everybody else when the dice gods screw them over because the dice gods are a are a true model of equality. It does not matter your race, ethnicity, gender, height, weight, whatever. The dice hate you. They're huh. a fickle crew for sure. And I can I consider that kind of inspiring. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, it's it's just fun. I mean, one of the reasons you do this as opposed to sitting around just telling stories is that somebody comes up with a situation and then you're like, well, what do you do now? Mm-hmm. And every group that you play with will have a different solution for that situation. Marty and I know this from running lots of demonstration games of different things, especially mm-hmm. at Game Hold Con. We ran like nine sessions of shotguns and sorcery, and everybody yeah. came up with different solutions for the problems that we would present them. Mm-hmm. And then the reason you roll dice is because the dice will screw with you too, right? And you're like, well, this plan sounded like a good idea at the time, but the dice told us no. So now we have to come up with another plan, right? It, it introduces complications and challenges to you, which I think is half the fun. Yeah. And with now with that with that in mind, now shotguns and sorcery, you describe it as a mix of um har- of high fantasy and hard-boiled noir. Um, right. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there are other genres that that you're taking bits and pieces from because oh, sure. ever because as my mentor used to say, if you steal from one guy, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen guys, it's research. Exactly. Sure. Oh. Well, well, I mean, for instance, it's in a it's set in a city that's surrounded by zombies. So clearly, we're doing apocalyptic zombie horror stories here as well, right? Yep. Uh, lots of other things get mixed in there too. It's that's... mostly just fun. Those are the two main things. Are High fantasy and noir for flavor and tone, but lots and lots of other elements get mixed yeah. in there too. So a city, sur- a city surrounded by zombies. When did this become yeah. a re- when did this become a simulation of New York? <laughs> no, I'm sure it feels that way often. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when it co- now uh, when it comes to when it comes to the whole hard boiled noir thing, um, how did you how did you get into that particular genre? 
Yeah, I started reading Raymond Chandler when I was in high school. I don't know why I stumbled across it. Um, but it always just appealed to me. And a lot of those classic Bogart movies, you know, the black and white films, mm -hmm. Maltese Falcon, etc. cetera. Uh, I started reading a lot of uh, Chandler and Hammett and things like that. I just really liked the style, right? Mm -hmm. the, style, the, the writing actually made you feel like you were in there, like it was this cool, edgy thing that you were a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that was very different than the other kind of stuff I liked, which was high fantasy. So if you're reading Tolkien or uh, Lewis or, you know, whoever else in those days, and lots of love to other great writers, uh, the, the style in there is very different. It's much more flowing and flowery, and uh, the noir stuff has a harder edge to it, even just in the way the text rhythm works, right? Mm -hmm. so what I wanted to see was something that had a lot of the elements of fantasy, but it had the rhythms and sensibility of noir. And that's really what we were trying to reach out and do something with when we did Shotguns and Sorcery. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with, that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, I... Within within the within the setup, given the fact that um, no, given the fact that noir is a genre that I th I think a lot of people know, but a lot of people don't know at the same time. When you're set when you're setting up um, when you're setting up one shots either at conventions or at LGSs or what have you, um, and trying to give people the skinny on the on the kind of setting that that's in shotguns and sorcery, how do you usually pitch it? Uh, we'll usually tell people it's you know, fantasy noir. The whole thing is that it's uh, uh, 500 years after a zombie apocalypse has tried to destroy an entire fantasy continent. And the free people that have survived have managed to gather around the Dragon Mountain where they cut a deal with the dragon to have the, the dragon protect the entire city from the zombies while they built a wall around it. And then they can put a city inside of that. 500 years later, this is then accreted where... Uh, uh, the longest living and most powerful people tend to live at the top of the mountain and the people are the most oppressed and, and, uh, and the least powerful live at the bottom of the mountain. So you have the dragon up at the top and the elves below him and the drag the dwarves below that mm -hmm. all the way down to the people in the village. And then below that in the slums, which we call goblin town, which is a nod to Tolkien's goblin town from, uh, from the Hobbit. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, that's where the people can hear the zombies still clawing at the walls and moaning at night and everything else. So it's a setting where, you know, uh, essentially that's happened, but also 500 years of living in a, a fantasy-themed pressure cooker where uh, civilization has advanced a bit. A lot of times in these stories, you have this uh, idyllic fantasy where you know, it's all just been farmland and everything else for thousands of years and nothing has actually progressed very far. But in this, it's more like a, a, a metropolis where things have gone so you have instead of glow uh, light bulbs or gas lamps you have glow globes which mm -hmm. are these magical things that light up in the streets of the city or you uh, if you need a ride from one part of the other uh, because there's not enough room for horses you they have got another system where you just stick up your hand and a uh, flying carpet will come down and give you a taxi ride from one place to another mm -hmm. right? uh, so it just has that kind of a, more of a city feel uh, it's kind of like taking urban fantasy but concentrating more on the fantasy than the urban part of it um, then you get traditional urban fantasy tends to be more modern and we're setting this in uh, a place that's in between Tolkien and modern day stuff. Mm -hmm. And you do touch on an interesting point, which is that a lot of, a lot of, a lot of settings, um, whether, whether it be fantasy or otherwise, even, even the, even quote unquote modern, even quote unquote modern fantasy tends to, tends to act like there's this kind of dead stop when it comes to, how ma how magic or ma or magic based technology um, progresses, right? Like you end up you end up have you end up having in a lot in a lot of cases this idea that even even with even with magic being known for a long time that it's still this secret thing. Which for some settings that can work. I mean, I like mage and I like the Dresden Files, but there's no reason that you sh that you have to go that route. Right, and that's one of the things in Shotguns and Sorcery is that magic tends to uh, permeate everything, right? Mm -hmm. It's all well known. It's it's it essentially saying, you know, take your standard D&D &D type setting mm -hmm. and then advance it 500 years under high pressure and see what the hell happens to it, right? Yeah. Uh, Eberron is kind of another stop along that, that road, so to speak. And uh, but I actually came up with this as uh, a entry in the world hunt where Wizards of the Coast was looking for a new world setting, and they chose Eberron, which mm -hmm. is done by my friend Keith Baker, who does a great job with it. And I actually wrote a trilogy of novels for it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, when I looked at Eberron, I'm like, well, that's kind of like what I was looking for. It's not really what I wanted to have. 
So let me do something that's more mine and more the kind of flavor I was looking at. And honestly, that's where a lot of uh, fiction writing or game design or any of this kind of stuff comes from, is when you know there's something out there you want, but it's not out there yet, mm-hmm. and you decide that you have to be the one to go make it. Yeah. Now, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to do when it comes to doing or when it comes to doing urban fantasy, um, and just just with just with urban adventuring as a whole, there 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 seems to be a there seems to be a mindset that you can that. The kind of adventures that you can do, and the kind of campaigns that you can do in a in a setting where it's all taking place in one city, is limited because because well, for a lot of people, they see they see fantasy and they think okay, dungeon delves and the like, right? Um, but what when it comes to when it comes to doing um when it comes to doing urban fantasy, did did you end up spending a with shotguns and sorcery? Did you end up spending a lot of time? Just making the city itself into its own character. You know, I, I, not as much as you would think. I mean, for me, uh, when I was starting out, I was coming up with the characters for the stories, right? Uh, and the city itself does have a lot of character, and I think it permeates everything else. But uh, to me, primarily, I was interested in telling some fun stories with these characters I had come up with, and wanted to build something around them that felt like a 1920s noir, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so it's rife with corruption and prejudices and all sorts of things. A lot of the stuff you see in fantasy games anyway, but it's made a little bit more explicit uh, in the way that we examine them in, in that kind of fiction. So um, so I think it's very different than a lot of the other things you see that way. Yeah. And to me, that was, you know, I wanted to have something that stood out, but also spoke to me and hopefully other people. Yeah. Now, I was first introduced to Shotguns and Sorcery through it, not necessarily through any, not necessarily through any of the stories per se, but through its um, previous adaptation with the right. cipher system, exactly. Yeah. Um, how did how did that how did that come about? Was it was it a case where you en- where you ended up meeting up with Co- with Cook, or was there a different path? Uh, well, it was because when we when uh, I told you before that Jeremy had, uh, Jeremy Muller at Outland Entertainment had licensed the property from me to mm-hmm. do a role playing game, so we went out looking for systems, and we're like, do we want to come up with our own system? Do we want to use something that's existing? Because it was originally a third edition uh, idea, we thought fifth edition would be great. But even though fifth edition had been released at that point in 2015, they had not put it into the OGL, the Open Gaming License, yet. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't available for other people to develop with. So that was out for us. So we started looking around for other stuff. And uh, we struck upon the Cypher system that Monty Cook Games had done. And I actually know Monty from way back. In fact, he was one of the guys who, he was the editor of my first big role-playing game book I ever wrote, which was Western Hero that came out back in like 1991 or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, so yeah, he and I have kept up a lot over the years and we've worked on a number of different things together. And the chance of me being able to do something with this very cool new rule system he had come up with, uh, we thought was a great idea. Um, and so, you know, he was on board with it. Uh, the rest of the team at Monty Cook Games was on board with it. The guys at Outland were excited about it. And then we hired in Rob Schwalb, who's a fantastic developer, Mm-hmm. Uh, we also had some experience with not only, not, not only was one of the uh, develop, designers for 5th edition and even 4th edition, but uh, had done some cipher system work already at that point. And I'm like, well, you know, Rob's going to know this better than anybody else. And he also had enjoyed the stories up to that point. So mm-hmm. uh, we ended up hiring him in on that. Um, so it just was, you know, kind of, it kind of felt right. It was the right group of people doing the right project at the right time, I think. Yeah. Um, jump Jumping from... Jumping from the the trappings of something like third edition to something like cipher, were there any were there any um, things that you had to kind of any habits that you had to kind of unlearn in the process, or was it a relatively smooth transition? Yeah, I'd say it was fairly smooth, mostly because you know as Marty was talking about in a, an interview we did earlier in the week. Uh, it's actually easier to develop for cipher system than it is for D and D, right? Uh, cipher system has a much more forgiving set of stats that you have to come up with for mm-hmm. NPCs. Uh, and in D&D, like for instance, if you want to come up with a 10th level something, there is a lot of math involved and there is an exact answer for how that should work, right? There's very clear options, which is fantastic when you're playing the game as a player, but when you're developing for it, it involves a lot of a lot of work, right? It can take you hours to come up with uh, it properly stat out of uh, high level character in Dungeons and Dragons, whereas mm-hmm. in Cypher System, it's much easier to develop for. Oh, yeah. Um, and also, Cipher System has this, uh, they literally have a small economy in it for what they call ciphers, mm-hmm. which are these one-off, you know, special magic or science fiction items, whatever you want to, whatever genre you have to be in. 
Um, and so for us, that was a little bit of a change because we didn't have that in shotguns and sorcery. So we're like, oh, okay, but it's a, core, a key part of the cipher system rules and how it works uh, is to give players these one-off things that they are encouraged to use because they're, they know they're going to be a lot more of them. They don't have to hoard them at any point. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Rob ended up doing a lot of work around that. And then when we were translating it back, Marty ended up re, uh, reworking a lot of that stuff to work in 5th edition as well. Mm -hmm. Now... That bring that brings me to the to the um fit to the fifth edition take on it, um. Where, how did how did the how, was it a case where where inevitably you get you guys said you guys said let's do a let's do a five e version of it or was there some talk was there some um. I guess for the lack of lack of a better word peer pressure because that seems to be the underlying theme tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean there's nobody saying hey you guys join the rest of the crowd right. Um, yeah. I mean, 5th edition is the best-selling role-playing game in the world and probably the best-selling version of it ever, too. So, yeah, And we play it. Yeah, we go to conventions, we play 5th edition with Marty and all the kids. Um, and we have a great time with it. So for us, it wasn't all that much of a stretch. Plus, because it was been a 3rd edition uh, idea, uh, translating to 5th edition seemed like naturally coming home and, you know, closing the circle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um but you know, I don't. There's always the thought that you know people are just jumping on the fifth edition bandwagon because it's there and it's lots of money and a bigger audience, which is true in a lot of ways uh, that those things exist. But for us, again, it it just thematically fit the property very well, um, and you know we're like, well, we have this property, we have this all this background information, we have all this fantastic artwork, and maybe we want to have a larger audience for it. And Marty had just graduated from University of Wisconsin Madison in. Uh, the spring of 2019, it was looking for something to do. So I ended up putting him on these Cypher System books, the expansion books. Mm -hmm. um, and when he was done with those, I'm like, are you interested in doing 5th edition? And he's like, yeah. Right, Marty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is a, it's a fantasy setting. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, uh, there, there are shotguns and there, there, there are various new mechanics in this mm -hmm. version, but uh, you'd be surprised how, how few big scale changes need to be made uh, between like this and, and normal vanilla D and D. Yeah. Right. Cause it was actually meant as a, a, a system or a setting for that originally. So mm -hmm. um, you know, making the transition over to making a, a standard D and D world was not terribly difficult. Now we do have a lot of innovations in this. A lot of them have to do with the gunplay and the way we treat races and stuff like that. Um, and some of the new races and characters and creatures that Marty came up with, mm -hmm. but, but you know, it, it's, Somebody who plays D and D is going to be able to step right into this and not even blink. Oh yeah. Now, I think we, I think we should, I think with that in mind, we should get into some of the meat and potatoes. If, if, um, if you'll, ex if you'll excuse me, dating myself with that reference. <laughs> sure thing. Um, on, on the on the fifth edition take. Now, I think whenever you're dealing with a campaign with a campaign setting that is not that is. Decidedly different from what from the hot from the hodgepodge of fantasy that D and D is, which has been a sore spot for sore spot for me for years. <laughs> but that but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, what are some what are some of the what are some of the what are some of the um what are some of the significant changes to the core sandbox aside from aside from changes to races, classes, and the like that would ha that should be taken that should be taken into account when someone's running it. Right. Those are actually the main things. I mean, the, uh, the thing that, uh, you know, with uh, introducing guns and not like, you know, fantasy pistols or flintlocks. Like anything. the whole game takes place in one city is the is the sandbox change. That's true. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. You were... No, I, I don't want to interrupt you about uh, like because there are a lot of changes on like the 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 uh, uh, the, the racing class. So th th this book has a whole new class in it. Well, we'll we'll get to we'll get to that, but I wanted I wanted to get I wanted to get at the ground level before I get to before I get to those kind of parts. Sure. And I'd say I'd say cover I'd say covering firearms is is fairly ground level, so I'll focus on that for a moment. Um, sure. I've seen I have this isn't my first time seeing um, seeing firearm conversions into a fantasy game, and a lot of them end up making the trap of taking. Exi taking existing ranged weapons and trying to reflavor them, would it be fair of me to say that that's not the route that you're taking? That there is a distinct difference between more archaic ranged weapons and full-on firearms in terms of mechanics. Yeah, definitely, Marty. Why don't you explain why you're the guy who actually designed this stuff? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, well, we're still making changes to some of this stuff as it goes on. The book isn't quite 100% oh, okay, so we done yet. Rob helping to, actually, we hired Rob to help us develop this book just like last week. So mm -hmm. uh, so we're tweaking and developing and refining things as we go. But Marty, go ahead and tell them the premise. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the Dungeon Master's manual has like uh, very rudimentary rules for firearms tucked away in the very back of it. Or it's like, uh, just, just, just treat them like... Uh, like hand crossbows or whatever, um, uh, and, and to a certain extent, certain certain guns in this game uh, work like you know like fast, high damage hand crossbows that you reload. Um, but but uh, a lot of the guns have like special mechanics um, that that uh, you know like they, they fire in a cone or they uh, they fire in a line or they but like they they have spread. And we also have you know like uh, special kinds of bullets that are, that are magical because it is a magical setting uh, uh where we uh and, and enchantments for guns where uh you know you, you just tap it on the ground and the whole thing reloads mm -hmm. right and one of the basic things that marty did is he made all the weapons armor piercing right which is one of the reasons that most people don't wear armor in the game because it doesn't really do any good against these right yeah we we wanted to 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 like it, it's supposed to be hard-boiled noir mm -hmm. like focus on role playing so combat is supposed to uh move fast death is supposed to be quick um it, 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 if if combat breaks out so bullets deal lots of damage and uh all 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 bullets are armor piercing mm -hmm. right. that's always one of my favorite things to play with the role playing game is uh, messing with the lethality levels right so uh, when you say armor piercing what do you mean that they do you mean that bullets ignore damage reduction or do they mess with AC? They mess with AC. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's it's one of those it's one of those things that I th I think needs to be clarified because what ca because especially especially when you've got when you've got ar when you've got armor and D and DR in some in some forms and some builds, um, or or you're or you're an asshole like me and and uh, and does multi classes as a palerer, a sorcerer paladin. Okay. Solely, I do that solely to piss off my DM. <laughs> but the other, th the other thing that I, th I think is that I feel is, I feel is worth noting is in a lot of in a lot of urban settings, the 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 usual um the usual money standard doesn't doesn't really transfer, like the whole the whole the whole gold stand gold stand gold and silver standard. Or G right. or the GP standard as it as it is for D and D, um, is that the case with shotguns and sorcery where the economy is not on gold and silver pieces but on something else? No, I think we still have gold pieces that are right. Yeah, 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 it's still on gold and silver pieces. I mean, the the value of certain items is slightly different because it the the whole setting is based around like nineteen twenties mm -hmm. technology. So like a, a single gold piece. Essentially approximates like uh, a 1920s America dollar, right? Uh, and there's certain things that are more expensive than others just because of the situation, right? Uh, they're, mm -hmm. hard, they're more rare in Dragon City than they would be in other places. And uh, conversely, there are some things that are a lot more common, right? Um, so you know, things are uh, somebody from the Forgotten Realms would consider to be high tech are not all that expensive in this world. So. Yeah. Now. <laughs> With going going past going past that, um, on the Kickstarter it mentions a revamped racial system, and I don't want to go into all of the races because we'd be here all night if we did that, obviously. But I would like to go into what exactly is meant by revamped. Is it a case where what you get from your choice of race is not is not entirely the same? Yeah, that's correct. Actually, we're working on this with Rob right now, but. Yeah, it's still uh, it's still being tweaked, um, but but the general thing is that most of the races are not uh, there's not there's very little in the way of racial bonuses. You end up getting to be able to pick and choose those based upon the places you're from and uh, the culture that you're involved in, and things like that, as opposed to uh, the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Oh, and even with that, there are t there are two new races that you have, that being mermen and beastmen. I would like to go into those and what and what you'd be getting out of those. 
Right, yeah. Marty started those out. He came up with them because we had kind of mentioned them as these things. They don't really generally live in the city. They live in the outskirts, and he fleshed those out a little bit better. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, they, 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 they were mentioned as uh, creatures in the original Cypher System game. And uh, uh, in this book, they, they, they're given a lot more detail. This book, this book contains, a, uh, I, I'd say, lore expansions for, for some of the smaller details mm -hmm. in uh, the, the, the original Cypher System game. Right, and since these have been mentioned and brought up, Marty said, well, why don't we make them into full-blown playable characters, right? Um, they tend to be a little bit tougher and rougher around the edges because, generally speaking, they're not from inside the city, they're from outside the city, mm -hmm. which means they've had pretty hard lives. Now, Often very short lives. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, before we, before, when it comes to classes, before we get into the, the nature of making standard classes compatible with shotguns and sorcery, I'd like you to go into the newcomer to the sandbox. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the new class. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the freelancer is a, it, it is a, it was a, it was a class designed specifically for, to be a, a, a noir class. Um, uh, we we had sort of a, a a grab bag of ideas of like uh, new classes we wanted to do for this game, mm -hmm. um, like like maybe we'll do like an investigator type class or maybe we'll do like a street fighter type class, like st stuff 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 that you would see in old noir movies or whatever. Um, and uh, we we ended up combining a bunch of that into one freelancer sort of hustler class. Um, and then, then we made those ideas into subclasses. Um, so, so the freelancer is the class to play if you if you want to be um, the hard boiled detective and have that be your job. Um, every other class, I mean, you you can uh, be a hard boiled detective, but you're a, a fighter or, or a, a healer or whatever first. Mm -hmm. And. Because when I, when I think of when I hear the term freelancer, I often think of a jack of all trades kind of archetype. Um, is, but the the um, the thing that the thing that's tricky with jack of all trades archetypes is that it's really hard to do them in a game with in a game with defined roles, as D and D is a game with a class system. Yeah. Uh, so how how do you make sure that the freelancer? Has has a special thing that they bring to the table, so it's not ju it's not just a case of being the um, anchor. Uh, well, I went through every single D and D class that existed, and I made sure that I wasn't doing exactly the same stat things mm -hmm. that I was in the pre-existing classes. <laughs> I mean, I to figure out what the gaps were and the overlaps were, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I brute forced it. That was the only way. <laughs> and, and and I made sure that the subclasses were distinct, mm -hmm. so that even even if because uh, I mean, the first few levels in D and D are all basically everyone's really close to each other in terms of stuff. I made sure that these subclasses branched off into into really distinct abilities, mm -hmm. which gives them it makes them a little bit more interesting for people in the long term. Oh yeah. And to that to that end, what can you tell me about the about what the subclasses bring to the table? Uh, well, I'd have to pull up the document. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, been a few while since I looked over all this. That's stuff. always the trouble with game design. Is it, there's two troubles. Is one, it's it's like by the time you're doing this, you probably wrote it six months ago. And the other thing is, you probably during development, you probably had 16 different ideas, and you're not always clear which of the last few you chose. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the subclasses were investigator, gunslinger, and monster hunter, mm -hmm. right. which which were all ideas we we had considered for full classes at one point, and then uh, we, we we thought they they might work better as subclasses. Um, the investigator being a, a detective, gunslinger being uh, somebody who specializes in firearms, monster hunter being uh, I don't know, like your Witcher type. Mm -hmm. And when it comes now. When it comes to when it comes to a when it comes to making the standard classes compatible, is it is it mainly re, is it mainly reflavoring a lot of the classes so that it fits within the lore of of shotguns and sorcery, or are there some classes that ha, that have that have new subclasses to help to help integrate them? Uh, we tried to make as few mechanical changes as possible to existing classes, so so there aren't. 
um, new subclasses um, for uh, old classes. There are a few new sets of rules, mm -hmm. optional rules for, for old classes. Like, uh, um, shotguns and sorcery is something of an agnostic setting. I mean, there, there, there are no um, mentions of uh, um, uh, religions or places of worship or gods at all in the original novels. Um, they, 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 they don't mention clerics or anything like that. They mention healers mm -hmm. and hospitals, but, but no, nothing like clerics. Um, so um, there, there's a, a fair bit of work in the new book done towards... Um, well, here's how you can play like um, an agnostic sort of cleric. Here's how you can play a godless cleric or mm -hmm. paladin. Um, here's here's how you can uh, uh, maybe if you want to um, cross out these spells, maybe you could do it this way. Or if you don't want to do that, you can contrive things another way. Yada yada yada. Yeah. Right. The, the idea was to give people options, especially if they already were coming over from an existing campaign. Because mm -hmm. one of the things about shotguns and sorcery with the zombies around and surrounding it, it's isolated, which means you could plop it down in, on the edge of a lot of currently going campaigns, as yep. opposed to having to just start off with something entirely new. Mm -hmm. Well, since we're since we're on that, I'd like I'd like to go down the list and how, and just and just give just give me a few ideas on how on how the typical example of this kind of class might be. Might be might be integrated within within shotguns and sorcery. Oh. If you if you get if you guys don't mind. Sure, go for it. Um, I'll start with I'll start with barbarians. Yeah, those are generally guys from outside the city, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're the the uncivilized folks, so there's a little bit more of a touch on that. Right, Marty. Uh, well, yeah. In, in the book, we have um. Uh, written down. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, barbarians are, um, yeah, people people who are trained in essentially, you know, sloppy combat, mm -hmm. um, hard combat. Um, uh, mostly people who are um, from outside the city. But uh, you know, if you if you have seen enough combat outside the city, you know, maybe if you're you're like a zombie fighter, mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody who spends all day. In a crazy rage, fighting uh, uh, um, the undead. Maybe if you work for the wall guard, or whatever the people who guard the walls, mm -hmm. um, you're a barbarian that way. Yeah. Um, bard. Um, all all of the wizard um, type, all, all of the spellcasters in Dragon City. Well, maybe, maybe Dad, do you want to take this? I want to see what your your knowledge is. <laughs> well, they all fall under the the purview of the Academy of Arcane Apprentices. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's actually a fairly rigid structure that goes with uh, what people are allowed to learn. And, like, for instance, necromancy is forbidden throughout the entire city. Um, and so that changes things a little bit, right? Especially if you haven't been working with a necromancer. Yeah, Marty has did a good job of like saying, okay, if you have a necromancer, this is how you might want to try to integrate them in society. And obviously it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but that can actually be kind of exciting from a gameplay point of view. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, all spellcasters, uh, bards, wizards, clerics, whatever, uh, come from the the Academy of Arcane Apprenticeship, which is the the one big wizard school on the upper part of the city. Um, and uh, the bards are just the ones who uh, studied history and singing. Right, they specialize in that. Inspirational songs, obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, um, next. Next on my on my little list would be um, clerics, and you can, you kind of touched on this when you mentioned um, healers, but for but for more but how would you integrate that for more offensive clerics for say war priests and the like? Uh, well, there are certainly healers who work for the uh, Dragon City has a a sort of uh, military uh, a sort of uh, police slash military system. It's all integrated into one thing. Mm -hmm. um, called the the Imperial Dragons Guard. Um, there, there's the Imperial Dragons Guard up top, which guards the top half of the city, and the Auxiliary Guard down below, which uh, guards the bottom half of the city, where all the poorer people live. And then they also guard the uh, the wall, where all the zombies are crawling up against it. Um, and there are certainly healers who work for like the wall guard, because there there are people out there who get injured fighting zombies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so ne next would be um, Druids. Sorry, I had to get a Mystery of the Druids joke out of my system. Of course. <laughs> uh, druids uh, are one of the one of the trickier ones um, because uh, the the whole thing with druids are they uh, their their magic comes from within, mm -hmm. um, but w within Dragon City, uh, all magic is supposed to be taught at a single academy. That's how it's written in the novels. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to have a person whose magic comes from within is um, uh, a, an abnormality, to say the least. Uh, but uh, we, we've rejiggered like sort of the the canon in this uh, uh, system to to work where um, the the source of magic in the setting is different. Magic permeates everything. The 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 academy just shows you how to essentially attune it. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, and mechanically, so, a lot of this doesn't change, right? It's just more of yeah. a, how do we rationalize how this works narratively? This is all just this is all just dressing over over the five E sort of uh, um, mechanic system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, ne so um, next next, I was gonna say I was gonna put say that fighter is next on my list, but I'd say fighter would be re would be relatively easy to do. Yeah, comparatively. Yeah. Um, so I'll skip that and go and go straight over into monk. Uh, the interesting thing about monks, the only the only um, thing with monks was uh, uh, was figuring out how to fit like martial combat training and like mm -hmm. some monks can do some spells into um, this this world where it's like, well, most magic is supposed to be taught at this one specific academy and. Where does the martial, you know, where, where where are people getting this martial combat training? Um, and uh, uh, again, we're we're like we're trying to um, figure out a way to just fit what exists in D and D into um, this setting. So it's like, well, martial combat training is something that the elves know about. You just didn't see it in the books. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's something that the elves know about, and. Uh, um, because magic permeates everything, um, uh, the 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 monks uh, who know some spells uh, are they're, are like they're like the druids. They're they're, they're uh, you know they 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 stumble onto this form of magic um, sort of abnormally mm -hmm. out, outside of the purview of the academy. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. With, I'd say I'd, I'd say the next one on the list, which is get, which is going to be an interesting one, is um, paladins. Yeah, the paladin is is uh, it's basically the same as the war priest. I mean, uh, uh, people people who work for the the uh, the P, uh, the the guard that um, uh, that guard the city, healers who uh, who are are also. You know, obsessed with killing the undead. Uh, that's that's sort of how we integrated it in. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, next would be arguably the most snake bitten class in in D in D and D over the years. Um, the ranger. Uh. Yeah, that's a tough one because there's not a whole lot of range. <laughs> yeah. There's not a whole lot of range. You can't go outside of the city unless you're you're uh, one of the, an adventurer doing legal stuff. We we came up with we tried to come up with multiple solutions, multiple narrative solutions for every class as much as we could. Um, the ranger, it's like well, if you're one of the 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 races who's living outside of the walls, um, then you might be a ranger with mm -hmm. ranger powers. If um, Sometimes the the military within the city will send scouts outside of the walls, and those can be rangers, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so on. So, yeah. Now, be after after that the um, the next one that I had on the on the list was rogue, which I'd imagine rogues would be one of the easier ones because an urban setting is almost tailor made for rogues. They're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they fit real well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but beyond beyond that, the ne the last ones that I, the last ones that I had on my list were sorcerer, warlock, and wizard. And of the three of the three of them, the only one that the only one that I'd be curious how you'd integrate that is warlock. Yeah, warlock is a uh, um, uh, an interesting one. Uh, one of the things we introduced in the in this um, version was a. Uh, uh, cults as organizations because because as part of coming up with uh, narrative ways to fit all these classes in uh, I had to come up with uh, a way to uh, essentially like have these these spellcasters who are not a part of the Academy of Arcane Apprenticeship these these spellcasters who are are, are clearly doing religious type things mm -hmm. um, be able to cast magic again in a in in a setting that centers around an atheistic academy, mm -hmm. um, uh, there there was a lot of um, it was a it was it was a it was not easy, um, and uh, for for warlocks, essentially because of the way that magic works in this setting, where it, it permeates everything, and you essentially everyone is kind of a druid because you 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 just Magic permeates everything. It's inside of everyone and everything. You you control it through through sometimes through training, sometimes through just concentration and figuring it out on your own. Um, warlocks are parts are, are are just part of an evil false cult who think that they're worshiping an evil god, but they're they're, they're actually just doing cult shit. Mm -hmm. And. Source, um, sorcerers in in co in a lot of core setups are people who get their ca people who get their casting abilities through some through um through some through some bloodline of of some sort. So how how do you how do you reflavor something like that within the within the setup? Is it more that they're more dangerous kinds of kinds of casters, or is it something different? Uh, sorcerers we reflavored like druids, just like, because cause everyone essentially has magic in their blood. Mm -hmm. Everyone is kind of a sorcerer and kind of a druid. It's just people who are more, it's like, it's like people who are, who are more or less tapped into the force, um, in Star Wars. Uh, um, it's, it's just, uh, um, uh, pe people who, uh, Maybe their parents knew something, and uh, they they handed it down to them, as as part of a bloodline thing. That's really all. Yeah. Now, when it comes to cults, you already mentioned one of them, but I'm guessing there's a ha there's a handful of different cults with their own agendas. Would it be fair of me to say that not every cult would be considered a evil one? No, some some of them are are definitely more evil than others. Um, some some of them are just uh, partying and having fun. Oh, all right, I can I can go I can go with that. Um, and you know, the Dragon Emperor is not always exactly the best person in the world either. Yeah. So you know, if you're fighting against the Dragon Emperor, there's a little bit of subversive fun going on there too. Well, um, would it be f um given given this given this kind of given this kind of given this kind of setting, I'm. I get the feeling that there's a lot. There's a lot of um, don't get don't get the dragon emperor's attention. Don't get the emperor's or his a or his agents' attention, kind of motif going around. Oh, definitely. I mean, that's that runs throughout the entire theme, the whole thing too, right? Once you get the dragon's attention, you're probably doomed. Oh. Uh, it's kind of like having a nuke sitting in the city that can point itself at you at any time it wants to. Yeah, I've I've li I've likened I've likened Ur urban fantasy and cyberpunk. In some in some ways to the labyrinth, I I e the labyrinth in Greek in um, Greek myth. Um, Not it, David Bowie. No, no, because no, because <laughs> I no, because I don't. I'm not walking around wearing it wearing a cup. Uh, yeah, okay, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is where somebody goes. I I thought this was a PG. I thought this was a PG podcast. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I I more refer to the f fact that 
there's corridors along corridors, twi um, cha chambers among chambers. The sit when you're inside the city, it feels like it doesn't have an end, and or inside the labyrinth, it, it feels completely endless. And don't you don't you dare get the attention of the Minotaur. Yeah, exactly. It's very much like that, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, there's all sorts of crazy things that can happen, and the dragon's uh, influence is felt throughout the entire city. Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to be rubbing up against that on a regular basis. The yeah. question is how hard is it going to happen, uh, and what kind of consequences you're going to incur if you if you push it too far. Mm -hmm. um, had there been had there been thought of of putting in some sort of mission generator into into the book? I don't think we did think of that, Marty. What do you think? No, no, we uh, we put a an, a an example adventure in the book, mm -hmm. right? And there's plot hooks, you know, scattered like you know, on every damn page, I think, uh, but nothing that's like as like a table or something you roll on. Yeah. No, I'm, oh, I'm well, well, we did. Uh, we are. We no. There, there, there are encounter tables in the back. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but um, as far as adventure hook generators or something like that, it's a little bit different. But yeah. you're right. There are plenty of. of uh, uh, random monster encounter tables. Yeah, there are random yeah. encounter tables in the yeah. back, but not random, like, adventure hook. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. We tend to be a little bit more hands-on with that. Mm -hmm. Now, with, the, with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a total page count? I know that these kind of, I know that these kind of things can be a bit wonky. What, what with... Right. Our current estimate is uh, going to be about 256 pages. We're hoping... We're hoping it might be a little bit bigger than that, or we think it might be a little bit bigger than that, but it really depends on the layout. Mm -hmm. We've got the layout from the original book, so we know roughly what we're talking about. Um, but it would be between 256 and 300. Yep, and I'm getting... One of the things that's smaller than the actual original book is that we don't have to include the entire system in it, right? Mm -hmm. You've got your D&D &D books. We don't have to include that 750 pages worth of stuff. You can lean on that as opposed to the rules that we had to strip out from the cipher system to do the D&D &D version. Oh, yeah. And with with that with that in mind, when it comes to the when it comes to the adventure that you put in um, miners miners and mobsters. Um, what kind of what kind of style of adventure is that is that really going for? Uh, that's meant to be an introductory adventure for basically first level players, at, but you could also, you know, uh, scale it up if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is like, okay, you're starting adventures, you don't know much about Dragon City. This is meant to introduce you to a lot of things going on in Dragon City and some of the seamier sides of it. Yeah. Which I think is important because whenever, whenever you have these kind of settings, there is the chance of um, what, I've what I've called continuity lockout. Right, yeah. Well, we're not planning to do a whole lot of other stuff with this. Um, you know, like one of the reasons you get continuity lockout is if people start doing splat books and story books and stuff like that, where the story no longer matches up with the premise, right? Mm -hmm. um, is, one thing we have done is that the stories that we have here, the, the game is basically set in the time of the short stories, which is before the novels, right? Mm -hmm. The novels actually, by the time you get to the end of the novels, there's a great status quo change. Um, so you basically be playing in two separate uh, kind of settings. So we are saying you know take this run with it have fun with it if you want to read the novels go ahead but you're not you know you, you're not going to be spoiling stuff for yourself because very likely your own game is going to go in a different dimension we're not planning to put out splat books or or supplements for this for years and years and years and lock people down that way yeah um and when that br that brings me that brings me to to one to one other thing um when it comes when it comes to when it comes to doing ur urban fantasy, you usually have player characters who are at the or at the very least, in in their particular community or in their particular circle. Um, but how how do you um, how do you maintain how do you maintain that when doing it when doing a session zero, so so that it's not a, so that it's not a case of of doing the you all meet in a tavern, um, <laughs> cliche. <laughs> Well, actually, we do have, we do have the characters all meet in the tavern. We kind of lean on that, right? Uh, in the novels, the main character Max Gibson actually purchases a tavern where he and his friends used to be. The uh, the people who would show up there and just plot their adventures they're going to have together, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of uh, his story, which is all that stuff's been untold, but it's referred to in the in the novels and stories. 
uh, one of their great friends dies as they're trying to escape their last adventure, and the entire party breaks up after that. So mm -hmm. Max comes back home, buys the tavern, and kind of uses it as a way to train adventurers or to get them started in the right direction. And Thumper, uh, the character that uh, we came up with for the bartender in the place, really does have a lot to do with that as far as guiding the characters, getting them started out. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's not the cl it, it does lean on the cliche of meeting in a tavern, but it does go in wildly different directions from there. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window for the PDF version? Not a release date, per se, but a window. Right. Well, we're hoping to have it done around the end of the year, right? I mean, 95% of the text has been done. I've got to write some fiction snippets. we got Rob Schwab doing the development on it, so he'll have some things to say. But he's actually working on it like at lightning speed right now. I've been shocked by how quickly it's going. Yeah, he's fast. Yeah, he really is. I mean, we must have hit him at just like the right moment in his schedule where he's like, yeah, I'm dying to do this, and yeah, I'll get it done right now. And I'm like, fantastic, you know? Um, so if we're lucky, we'll still be able to have it out, I would say, early January, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're just shooting for that. The The actual uh, delivery date on the Kickstarter is in August of next year. And that, to me, is a very pessimistic timeline. But given the troubles that people have had with uh, global supply chain issues uh, for printing and everything else in the world, um, you know, I'm not uh, that we want to give ourselves as much uh, elbow room as we possibly could have there. Mm -hmm. And it's un it's understand it's understandable. And I even if there weren't the supply issues that have, that have been going on lately, I still I still would have I still I still would have taken that approach simply because the first casualty is always the plan. Oh, for sure, right? I mean, the the dirty secret is that. This is what has always happened in game design. It's just that nobody saw it until we started doing Kickstarters, which meant that we told you about it too early, mm -hmm. right? Uh, lots of games uh, got killed off in development or turned out to be bad ideas, especially in video games. You see this all the time, but even in tabletop games. And lots of games got sidetracked because the creators had, you know, uh, a death in the family or an illness or, or some other crazed uh, thing that happened and disrupted everything they were doing and shot all their plans into the sun. And uh, so it's been tricky that way. But I think that, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons we want to make sure that we didn't have those kind of issues, especially since the last Kickstarter that I was done with this property in 2015 took so long to fulfill. We wanted to put people's minds at rest by having almost the entire thing done ahead of time and by making sure that uh, we gave ourselves plenty of room to make sure we hit that deadline. Mm -hmm. But with, the, with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you two for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the insanity that comes that comes around here well thank you for hosting this was a lot of fun and yeah. anytime you see fit to return whether it's to further delve into shotguns and sorcery or just to just just to la just to laugh at the at the up umpteenth revision of the ranger which i know is inevitable <laughs> <laughs> uh, the door is always open as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Sounds friendly. And of Thank course, you again for having us on. And and of course, a sincere thanks goes out goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>